Welcome one and all, I'm Dave. And I'm Jacob, here to make this look good. Yeah, building your own PC from scratch is not just an immensely satisfying experience, it also means you can put together the perfect gaming machine for you and for your budget. It's ridiculously easy too, no longer do you have to mess around with clock timings and jumper switches, it's just a case of putting together some very simple components in the right order. Yeah, just need a little bit of patience, the right parts, and a screwdriver. From then on it's about as easy as putting together a simple Lego set, maybe like a, a 9014 build, like the Millennium Falcon, that's part number 75105 by the way. What do you want about? Well MSI gave us all these parts to like, you know, make a video, so I was hoping someone from Lego might be watching, you know, for use. Fair enough. Yes, as Dave says, our friends at MSI have supplied us with all the PC goods required, so we can show you just how easy it is to build your very own gaming rig from scratch. So obviously you can just buy a pre-built gaming PC from any one of the million or so system builders around and it won't necessarily cost you a huge amount more than if you were just to build one from scratch. So why go through all the hassle of putting it together yourself then? Well because buying a pre-built machine is boring and it's just way too easy. Plus no matter how complex the system configuration menus are, you're not going to be able to tailor the build specifically to your PC needs. They won't necessarily be offering machines with the exact right CPU, GPU, RAM, motherboard or SSD that you really want. That means you're stuck with the components that they've struck for exclusivity deals with the manufacturer. Building a PC from scratch means that you can pick whatever components you want, whether that's based on price at the time or personal preference. You don't even have to buy MSI components if you don't want to. You can't say that. Remember? I'm making my the hats again. Okay, yeah. Sorry, you have to buy the MSI components. They're great. Other graphics cards and motherboards are available. So you've had all the goodies delivered for your new PC build and they're just sitting there waiting to be dumped into a chassis and booted up. So time to dive in and start building, right? Well, there is one preemptive step you really ought to take before screwing everything into place. Test your bits. Yeah, it's a step most people won't bother to do, but if you've got the patience, it can save you some real heartache later on. Checking that your main components will at least boot outside of the box will highlight any potential problems you may run into once you've screwed them all into the tight confines of your case. It makes it easier to find the offending component and replace. You can be a bit cavalier here, like a proper tech journal, and just use your motherboard box as a test bench. Drop the CPU, memory, GPU and cooler onto the board and plug everything into the PSU. Be careful when inserting the CPU not to batch any of the pins in the board or with an AMD chip on the processor itself. There are little markings on both the socket and chip to help you orient them. Likewise the RAM will only go in one way, with a notch in the middle of the socket to help guide you. Unless you're filling all the available DIMM slots with modules, then you'll need to pay attention to the guide on the board to show which are the primary sockets. Normally it's a combination of the slot furthest away from the CPU, then with the next slot free, your second module should go into the third socket. So now we need to get the CPU cooler attached to the board. There will likely be some pre-applied thermal paste on the chip chiller if it's brand new. If not, you'll just need to put some thermal paste onto the CPU itself. Now screw the cooler down into the bracket and you're good to go. Now drop in the graphics card into the primary PCIe slot, that's the one nearest to the CPU, and plug in all the necessary power supply connectors. So you'll need to get the CPU power, the motherboard power, the CPU cooler power, and the graphics card power all connected up from the PSU. Then connect your monitor and power the system back up. Ideally you should now be able to get into the BIOS. If you can get there, then you know your components are working. So there you go, you've built a new PC, job done. Well, sadly you now need to go and break it up to get it properly built. Though to make things easier, you can leave the CPU and memory in place. The PSU and water cooler are probably the most awkward parts, so you need to get these into your chassis first. If you're going with an air cooler however, you will need to drop that in later, after you've fitted the motherboard. Take both side panels off your new chassis and remove all the gubbins inside, like screws and those manuals no one reads. Now first we're going to attach the power supply. This can go in two ways and just sits in the base of our chassis. The Thermaltake PSU we're using is fully modular, meaning we only need to plug in the cabling that we 100% need, leaving a little more space inside your rig. That also makes it easier to fit. The size and positioning of the reservoir and fans of the water cooler means we need to attach it to the chassis before the rest of the components go in. On most coolers there will be handy arrows on the fans to help you figure out their orientation during installation. You don't want them blowing hot air into your case. We're installing the radiator in the roof of the chassis, so we've had to remove a fan. We're then attaching the fans from underneath to blow air over the radiator and out of the case. With the CPU and memory still plugged into the motherboard, you can install the lot into your eagerly awaiting chassis. But first make sure the motherboard risers are in place in the case's motherboard tray. These keep the board's contacts away from the metal of the chassis. 
If you screwed it directly into the base, you'd end up creating a short which could potentially fry all the components in the board as soon as you pass any power through it. For reference, that's a bad thing. For a micro ATX or mini ITX board, however, you'll need to rearrange the risers to fit the relevant screw holes. This thermal take chassis has a large cutout in the motherboard tray to allow you to access the mounting bracket of your CPU cooler. It's worth checking this before you attach the motherboard to decide when to attach the cooler's mounting bracket. Some budget-oriented cases might not give you the luxury of leaving it until after the board is in place. Check first to avoid the pain and ignominy of having to remove components you've spent ages installing just to screw in a cooler's backplate. Now it is time to attach your chip chiller to your processor. With a water cooler, you're essentially just attaching the liquid contact point to the CPU, along with the miniature pump itself. With a more standard air cooler, you're mounting the whole thing on top of your chip. You will also need to think about the orientation of the fans on an air cooler. Ideally, you want them venting the hot air coming off the attached heatsink outside of your case, so you need to make sure the fans are pointing in the same direction as the rear fan on your chassis. Top airflow tip there. You'll likely need a backplate to allow for a snug, secure fit for your cooler. As we mentioned before, our case would have allowed us to attach it after we'd installed our motherboard, but as we had tested the parts earlier, we left the bracket in place. Because of that, we squished the pre-installed thermal paste which came with our cooler, so we had to clean it off and apply some fresh thermal gunk onto the heat spreader of our CPU. This is to ensure a good contact between it and the cooler. You need a blob of thermal paste that's around the size of two grains of rice set into the middle of the chip. The action of attaching and screwing down the cooler will evenly spread out the paste. Now simply screw your cooler down. They can be awkward beasts, so this one time only we're going to recommend having a look at the instructions for your particular cooler, as they can also have very different installation and mounting methods. We're going to be installing SSDs in our build here because we're super elite PC peeps, but if you've gone for a more parsimonious budget build or if you've added extra data storage, then dropping in a standard 3.5 inch hard drive is largely the same as a SATA SSD. The tallest HDD bays allow us to simply drop in a 3.5 inch hard drive, but with the smaller SATA SSDs like this crucial drive, you have to screw it into a waiting drive bay. We'll attach the cables later. With an M.2 NVMe drive like this wee Samsung SSD here, you need to install it directly into the motherboard itself. Locate the relevant slot, riser and screw, slot it into the M.2 socket and screw it down. This is the least pleasing bit of system building, getting all the cables attached. It's so tedious, but annoyingly really important. Because this is a fully modular power supply, we'll need to get all the cable plumbed into it first. We're starting with the main motherboard cable, pass it through the cable management holes in the back of the chassis, and plug it into the PSU. Now we're moving on to the CPU power, again pass that through the back and plug it into the power supply. We also need to get some SATA power cables attached, push them through the rear of the case, and connect them to the PSU. These are for our storage needs. We also need to get these little Molex power cables plumbed in for our CPU cooler's all-important RGB controller. Finally, we need to get some power to our graphics card, so get that cable plugged into one of the empty PCIe sockets on the PSU, leave it out front as we need to connect it to the top of the graphics card. Now we need to get all the right wires jammed into the right sockets on your motherboard. Take your time with this because it's easy to miss something simple if you rush through it. This is the reason we're leaving the graphics card till last, as it allows us easier access to the motherboard. Start off with the motherboard and CPU power cables, those are the two big ones coming from your PSU. Your chassis may have cutouts to help with the routing of your cables, allowing you to pass them behind the board to keep the build clean. You also need to make sure you've got the CPU cooler cables and pump if you're running a water cooler plugged into the board. You also now need to get all the chassis front panel cables plumbed into the motherboard too. The USB extension cables, whether USB 2.0 or 3.0, are easy to attach, as is the audio pass through and only go in one way. The lights, power and reset switches, however, are a little more awkward. Hopefully the motherboard will detail which pins those tiny plugs need to be attached to, so refer to the board or, heaven forbid, the motherboard manual to help. You also need to get power to and data from any SATA drives you have attached to your system. That means one power cable from the PSU to the drive and one data cable from the motherboard. Now it's time to install the superstar component to your gaming rig, the graphics card. We're lovingly slotting the mighty GTX 1080 Ti into this gaming build because we can, and because MSI have foolishly left the almost unnecessarily hefty GTX 1080 Ti Gaming X Trio in the office. They're so not getting that back. Once you've dropped, sorry, sorry, carefully placed your graphics card in the primary PCIe slot, that's the one closest to the CPU, you need to power it. We are plumbing in a horrendously expensive powerful GPU here. But unless you're installing a low-end GTX 1050 Ti or RX 560, all other graphics cards are also going to need extra power connections direct from the PSU, or you're going to get nothing out of it. 
but once you've got all that plumbed in, you're good to go. So let's boot. Before you power up for the first time, it's worth taking one final look inside your build to make sure that all the components are securely fastened and plugged in. Win. Okay, so don't put the side panel on just yet because you want to make sure that all the fans are spinning and there's nothing obstructing them. Okay. Right, so you've got to get ready, plug the main power cable in, attach the mouse and keyboard and connect your monitor to the graphics card output specifically. Yeah, not the motherboard. Not, not very important, not the motherboard. Come on. Okay, all right, all right we're in, we're in, we're, we're in. It's exciting and we're ready to boot okay. for the first time. And hit the power switch. E That's a positive. Right, now we can bask in the glory of your beautifully built PC booting into the BIOS for the first time. Win. Okay, so now we can put the side panel back on and get on with the most satisfying part of the build. We fought over who got to do this. I'm just going to leave it in silence. Of course it might not necessarily boot perfectly first time, but don't panic, there are a few quick steps you can do. Yeah, RAM is normally the most likely offender in this, so boot down your PC, unplug it and reseat the memory in the sockets again. That could sort everything out. If it doesn't, it could be that your CPU cooler is too tightly screwed into the mounting bracket. Sometimes that can warp the motherboard and affect the connections on there. So do that and you should be golden. Of course, you can also check the back of the power supply just to make sure you've actually turned it on. Yeah, we definitely did that. Definitely, definitely, did that. definitely have yeah, never done that once before. No, no, we're pros. Okay. Anyways, that's how to do the physical build of everything and get your gaming monster to a point where you're ready to start thinking about the software. But that's part two of our build guide. See you on the other side. <laughs>